Hey there, Daniel here. Back in 2011, Japan was hit by the devastating Toku earthquake and tsunami. Amid the chaos and destruction, an unlikely group stepped in to help. They organized relief efforts faster than the government. They began sending truckloads of supplies, food, water, blankets, and medicine to the hardest hit areas. They didn't wait for permission or red tape, they just acted. Other families followed suits, using their networks and resources to provide immediate assistance, even in areas where official help hadn't yet arrived. The strange part about all this was, these families that were helping out were actually part of a criminal organization. A very deadly and lethal group involved in all kinds of nasty things. But why would a dangerous criminal organization help in a time of crisis? Part of the reason is their code. Despite their dark dealings, they view themselves as protectors of their communities. They've always had a strange mix of criminality and a sense of duty, and in times of need, this sense of obligation kicks in. Of course, there's also a strategic side. By helping out, these lawbreakers improve their image, gaining a certain level of public goodwill while flying under the radar of law enforcement. It's an odd twist where the good deed comes from a dark place, but it shows how layered and complicated their world really is. This story is just one of many that illustrates the fascinating, paradoxical nature of Japan's most infamous criminal group. They may be feared, but in moments like this, they also reveal a strange kind of heroism. Buckle up, because today we're diving deep into the mysterious and dangerous world of the Japanese Mafia that's been both feared and romanticized for centuries. This is the wild story of the Yakuza, Japan's most feared and misunderstood crime syndicate. The Yakuza didn't start out as the super organized criminal empire we know today. Their origins go back to the Edo period from 1603 to 1868, when two distinct groups of outcasts roamed the streets. One group, the Bakuto, were gamblers, think high risk poker games, but with samurai. The other, the Takia, were street peddlers selling everything from goods to fake goods. They weren't exactly noble, but they weren't the violent mobsters we picture today either. In fact, the word Yakuza itself comes from a losing hand in a card game. Ya, eight. Ku, nine. Sa, three. Which literally means bad luck. But bad luck didn't stop these early Yakuza from organizing themselves into clans, each with a strict code of honor. As they grew in number, they got involved in more serious crimes like protection rackets and smuggling. And soon, they had entire neighborhoods under their control. Here's where things get even more interesting. The Yakuza are notorious for their extreme loyalty, which isn't just a word, they will prove it. If a Yakuza member messes up, they don't just get a stern talking to. They perform an ancient ritual called Yubitsum, where they cut off the tip of their pinky finger and present it to their boss as an apology. Brutal, right? But in the world of the Yakuza, loyalty is everything. Tattoos are another iconic part of Yakuza culture. Full body tattoos called Irizumika are often intricate masterpieces that tell a story. These tattoos cover almost every inch of skin, except where clothing covers the body. It's both a mark of pride and a warning to others that you're not someone to be messed with. The Yakuza reached the pinnacle of their power in the 1950s through the 1980s, a time when their influence spread throughout Japan and even expanded internationally. Their rise to prominence during this period was fueled by post-war chaos, a booming economy, and their deep ties to various sectors of society, politics, real estate, and finance. After World War II, Japan was in ruins and the country's economy was in shambles. The black market flourished, and this is where the Yakuza seized their opportunity. The government was weak and the streets were lawless, which allowed Yakuza gangs to fill the power vacuum. They offered protection services to businesses, dominated illegal gambling, and took control of the thriving underground economy. By the 1950s, Japan's rapid recovery and industrialization met new opportunities for profit. The Yakuza evolved from street thugs into powerful businessmen. One of the most infamous figures during this time was Kazuo Taka, the leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi, the largest Yakuza syndicate in Japan. Known as the Godfather, Taka was a strategic mastermind who expanded his empire across Japan and beyond. Under his leadership, the Yamaguchi Gumi operated not just as a crime organization, but almost like a corporation involved in gambling, construction, and entertainment businesses. The 1960s and 1970s were the golden years of the Yakuza. During Japan's rapid economic growth, Yakuza groups became major players in the construction and real estate industries. Japan was building new highways, skyscrapers, and stadiums at a breakneck pace, and the Yakuza found ways to skim off the top. They would control unions, threaten contractors, and use their influence to secure lucrative deals. At one point, it was estimated that Yakuza members controlled nearly 40% of the construction industry. Even more shocking was the Yakuza's infiltration into politics. In the 1970s, 
Yakuza leaders develop close relationships with politicians, providing them with protection and, at times, even campaign funds. This was the era when corruption was rampant and the Yakuza were heavily involved in behind-the-scenes deals. They used bribery, intimidation and even violence to sway political decisions. One of the most infamous incidents occurred in the 1970s when Kakuei Tanaka, a former Prime Minister of Japan, was linked to the Yakuza. It was discovered that his political campaigns had been financed by Yakuza money, a scandal that rocked the political landscape. But it also revealed just how deep the Yakuza's roots had grown within the corridors of power. The 1980s was the height of Yakuza influence. Maybe you don't remember the 80s like I do. But there was a real irrational fear in the West that Japan was going to be the new number one superpower in the world. Ever see Blade Runner with Harrison Ford? It takes place in a future where the entire world is run by Japan. Yes, the fear that everyone would be speaking Japanese by 2024 was real. Anyways, by the 1980s, the Yakuza had grown to unprecedented levels at their peak. It's estimated that there were over 100,000 Yakuza members across various syndicates in Japan. The Yamaguchi Gumi alone had around 40,000 members dwarfing other crime organizations around the world. During this time, the Yakuza also expanded internationally. They became involved in every terrible racket you have ever heard of. Their influence spread to the United States, particularly in cities with large Japanese communities such as Los Angeles and Honolulu. Yakuza members were even rumored to have ties with the Italian Mafia and Chinese triads, making them a key player in global organized crime. One key factor that contributed to their power in the 1980s was Japan's bubble economy. The stock market and real estate prices soared and the Yakuza thrived. They heavily invested in real estate, casinos and high-end clubs, turning massive profits. They were not just street criminals anymore. They had become billion-dollar enterprises. The Sumiyoshi Kai and the Inagawa Kai, two other major Yakuza syndicates, were also at the height of their power. These groups, along with the Yamaguchi Gumi, formed the backbone of Yakuza influence. They were involved in everything from extortion and loan sharking to legitimate business ventures. A notorious event that showcases the Yakuza's reach occurred in 1982, when a fire broke out at the luxury hotel New Japan in Tokyo, killing 33 people. It was later revealed that the hotel was owned by Mokoto Kumagai, a businessman with deep ties to the Yakuza. The fire was caused by gross negligence and cost-cutting measures, leading to a huge scandal. Despite the deaths, no Yakuza members were held accountable. This event demonstrated the Yakuza's ability to operate with near impunity, even in cases of national tragedy. By the late 1980s, the Japanese government had begun to realize the extent of Yakuza influence and enacted strict anti-gang laws to combat them. The anti boryokudan law of 1992 was a significant turning point making it easier for authorities to arrest Yakuza members and seize their assets. This law, combined with the bursting of Japan's economic bubble in the early 1990s, marked the beginning of the decline of Yakuza power. The days of the Yakuza openly flaunting their wealth and power were coming to an end. Although still influential today, the golden era of Yakuza dominance from the 1950s to the 1980s remains a dark yet fascinating chapter in Japan's history. The Yakuza in modern Japan still in the shadows, but in the spotlight too. Today, the Yakuza may not run the streets like they once did, but they're still very much alive. In fact, it's estimated there are still over 12,000 active Yakuza members in Japan, although their numbers have been declining due to strict anti-gang laws and the shrinking allure of joining the mob. These days, the Yakuza are more business-minded. Some have even transitioned into the world of finance and real estate. They've also been known to help during disasters like the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, when Yakuza groups organized relief efforts before the government could respond. It's an odd mix of criminal activity and public service, but that's part of the paradox that makes them so fascinating. What's daily life like for a Yakuza member? Well, it's not all gunfights and high-speed chases, as Hollywood would have you believe. A lot of it involves sitting at a desk handling finances or overseeing less glamorous ventures like pachinko parlors, a type of arcade game, and hostess clubs. They still maintain their strict hierarchy and conduct rituals, but the criminal world has changed. Yakuza families, or kumi, are structured much like corporations. There's a boss at the top, the oyabun, underbosses and soldiers. Each person has a role, and the entire operation runs like clockwork. Even the way they present themselves has shifted. The Yakuza members used to wear flashy suits and drive expensive cars. Today, they're more low-key, blending in with society to avoid police attention. What does the future hold for the Yakuza? While the Yakuza have a long storied history, their future is uncertain. Laws are getting stricter and the public's tolerance for their activities is dwindling. But one thing's for sure, the Yakuza have woven themselves into the fabric of Japan's history. 
and they're not likely to disappear anytime soon. So, the next time you see a heavily tattooed man walking down a Japanese street or hear about organized crime in the news, remember, there's a deep, complicated, and sometimes strange history behind it. The Yakuza may be shadowy, but they're nothing if not fascinating.